Okay, so we're going to take a look at the next section, which is on Riemann sums. So in 4.2, when we're talking about areas, we used rectangles that had equal width. Right, so we always had this width was going to be B minus A divided by N. It had the same exact width. And then we were able to approximate our areas. Oh, but a Riemann sum, it's going to be very similar, except you can pick intervals of any width and any endpoints. So we were somewhat willy-nilly about our endpoints. We said you could choose the right endpoints and the left endpoints. The Riemann sum is going to help really clarify everything. It basically says you pick any way to divide the widths of your rectangles and you pick any strategy of picking endpoints. You can even mix and match if you want. It doesn't really matter. That will define ourselves a Riemann sum. So the formula for Riemann sum is going to be the sum from i equals 1 to n of f of c sub i times delta x sub i. This should look identical to what we just did. So basically, Riemann sums is doing the same exact thing that we did, except with a slight twist. And that slight twist here, we're going to call the width of the largest interval this two vertical bars. This would be like the magnitude of this delta. So this is going to be the largest width. Then our area is going to be the limit as this largest width goes to zero. So in our example, we said n went to infinity. We had limit as n tends to infinity because when you have equal widths, that's perfectly fine to do. If you don't have equal widths, then you can't just be okay with n going to infinity. Because right, you could have one really wide chunker of, a, of an interval, and then the other rectangles, could you could have an infinite number of them in a region, but if this first rectangle isn't getting smaller, then it's not going to give you an exact. So that's why just a slight twist there. So just become, just basically say, okay, this notation, it just looks the same. Don't get really confused by it. It's just saying that the largest width goes to zero. So we're now going to define what's called a definite integral. So we've already defined integrals. We talked about this indefinite integral before. Now we're going to talk about definite integrals. So if f is defined on the interval from a to b, including the endpoints, then the following limit exists. So this limit that we're defining over here is so basically if this area exists underneath this curve, this limit exists, then f is said to be integrable. Now if you're thinking about when when wouldn't the area be well defined? Well, if you had some type of weird jump discontinuity with an infinite discontinuity and in things, I could make it so the function's still defined on that interval, but the limit won't exist. So we're not going to be looking at those cases. We're going to be saying this limit exists. Then we say f is going to be integrable. So f is an integrable function, and this above limit is called the definite integral of f from A to B. So the definite integral is this, which we said is an area. So the indefinite integrals that we've looked at, remember an indefinite integral had to do with antiderivatives. It was a group of functions that gave you a derivative equal to something, right? So remember, think back to antiderivatives. Those were indefinite integrals had to do with functions and its derivative. Here, instead, we're not talking about derivatives. We're not talking about any of that. We're simply saying that this definite integral is an area. That's it, from A to B for F. So this notation is that this limit, as long as this is finite and exists, we're going to write it like this. This integral of F of X dx, but notice there's numbers on the top and the bottom. So these numbers, A and B, are going to be numbers that we're going to plug in. This top one's called the upper limit of integration. The bottom number is called the lower limit of integration. So this notation should look similar, except remember, with the indefinite integrals, there were no numbers. We only had this integral sign with the function with the dx saying with respect to x. So if we think about the relationship between this notation here for the definite integrals, what's happening is that this sum, this sum is turning into this integral. Basically, we're saying that this integral corresponds to this infinite sum, if we would like, and it goes from A to B, right? Our, our integral, our functions defined from A to B, we're defining this on this closed thing. So we have the starting and the ending there, the integral, the sum becomes an integral, the f of c sub i, this just becomes f of x. x is going to be just some variable, 
and then the delta x is going to become dx. Now, we saw that before when we looked at differentials. Remember, we had this delta x and dx up here, and we had the delta y dy. So we've seen this notation before, and so this is how taking a limit of this helps us see this notation appear.